Hi, and welcome back to my videos for Physical Chemistry 1. In the last video, we found out how to calculate the entropies of some simple physical processes, like mixing two gases, or changing the phase of a substance. We also talked about some factors that can help us determine whether the entropy of a chemical reaction increases or decreases. But so far, we haven't talked about how to find the precise value of a chemical reaction, and that's what I want to tell you about today. As we'll see in several future videos, knowing the entropy change that takes place during a chemical reaction will be the key to knowing whether or not a chemical reaction is possible in the first place. To begin, let's use what we've learned to determine whether the entropy increases or decreases for a couple of different reactions. Here's a chemical reaction in which sodium bicarbonate and hydrochloric acid react to form CO2, water, and sodium chloride. Does the entropy increase or decrease during this reaction? To find out, we just remember those three factors that we saw earlier. The first one is the phase. In this reaction, we start with a solid and an aqueous compound, and we end up with a gas, a liquid, and another aqueous compound. So, overall, we've exchanged a solid compound for a gas and a liquid. Both of those have a higher entropy than the solid, so the entropy in this reaction goes up. Also, notice that the number of different compounds increases. We have two on the reactant side and three on the product side. That's another reason why the entropy will increase. Finally, notice that the number of molecules also increases from two to three. So, all three of the factors that can affect the entropy all work to make the entropy go up in this reaction. Here's another example. In this reaction, will the entropy go up or down? In this case, the phase is the same for all of the molecules, so that won't affect the entropy. However, there are two different compounds on the reactant side and just one on the product side, so that'll make the entropy decrease. Also, we're going from a total of three molecules for the reactants to two for the products. That also will make the entropy decrease. But notice what that means for these two reactions. Since the entropy increases in the first reaction, it can happen spontaneously even if it's in a closed system. And here's that reaction. As you can see, we're starting with solid sodium bicarbonate, which is the same thing as baking soda, and one of the products is CO2 gas, which you can see bubbling out of the beaker. On the other hand, the entropy decreases in the second reaction, so that one won't happen spontaneously in a closed system. If we want to make that reaction happen, we'll need to put energy in, which means it won't be a closed system anymore. You might have noticed that our definition of entropy is a little bit vague. We said it's the amount of disorder in a system, but how do you quantify disorder? How can we put a number on something that's as hard to define as the amount of randomness? One thing we can do is to try to decide what something would look like if it had no disorder at all. What would a system look like if it had zero entropy? Well, remember that the phase is the most important factor in determining whether or not something has a high or a low entropy. If we want to make a compound with an entropy of zero, this gives us a hint on how to do it. If we change our compound to a solid, that will have a lower entropy than a liquid or a gas. But even solids like this salt crystal don't have a zero entropy. The atoms in the crystal can still move and vibrate a little, so there's still a little bit of randomness in their positions. If we want to prevent that, we need to get the atoms to completely stop moving. How would you do that? From the work you did with gas laws in General Chemistry 1, you might remember that molecules move more slowly at lower temperatures. So, if we want to make them stand still, we need to lower the temperature all the way down to absolute zero. When that happens, we'll have what's called a perfect crystal, and the entropy will be zero because the atoms in the crystal will not be moving. In fact, that's what's known as the third law of thermodynamics. The third law says, the entropy of a perfect crystal is zero 
at a temperature of absolute zero. It turns out that this gives us a way to determine the exact entropy of any substance. To find the entropy of a compound, for example liquid water, we just need to determine how disordered it is compared to a perfect crystal. Unfortunately, that is not easy to do, but luckily for us, this has already been done over the years, and as a result, there's a long list of entropies in the third column of Appendix C in your textbook. The symbol for entropy is a capital letter S, and it has units of joules over kelvins times moles. Notice that, unlike the enthalpy, the units for entropy include kelvins. If you think about it, that makes sense. We know that the temperature has a big effect on the entropy. The higher the temperature, the more disordered a system becomes. So, the temperature affects the entropy quite a lot. You can actually see that in the data in Appendix C. Notice that the entropy in Appendix C has the symbol S with a little circle next to it. We usually call that symbol S0. The little circle means that the data was measured at standard temperature and pressure. That means 25 degrees Celsius and one atmosphere. If we do an experiment at any other temperature, the entropy will be different. We'll see exactly how the temperature changes the entropy in the next video. But for now, we'll just work on the problems where the temperature is at 25 Celsius. So, what can we do with the entropy data in Appendix C? Well, from General Chem 1, you might remember that we can also use Appendix C to calculate the enthalpy change that happens during a reaction. Here's the equation that we used for that. The enthalpy change for a reaction is just the enthalpy of the products minus the enthalpy of the reactants. It turns out that we can find the entropy change in a very similar way. For example, consider this reaction. If we want to know its entropy, we just look up the entropies of the products and reactants in Appendix C and plug them into the equation. The entropy of magnesium hydroxide is 63.24 joules per kelvin mole. Magnesium oxide is 28.8, and liquid water is 69.95. Notice that some compounds, including water, appear in the appendix more than once. That's because the entropy is different depending on whether the compound is a gas, a liquid, or a solid. If more than one phase is listed, be careful to use the data for the phase that you really want. Anyway, when we solve this equation, we find that the entropy change for the reaction is negative 33.51 joules per kelvin mole. Notice that the entropy is a negative number. That means that the amount of disorder is decreasing. That makes a lot of sense. If you look at the reaction, we started with two compounds and ended with just one. As a result, we'd expect the amount of disorder to decrease. Also, notice that we started with a solid and a liquid, and we ended with just a solid. That's another reason we'd expect the disorder to decrease. And that's exactly what we got from our calculation. Let's try another example. What will be the entropy change for this reaction? Once again, we'll use this formula to determine the entropy of the reaction. The product is water vapor, which has an entropy of 188.83 joules per kelvin mole. But wait, before we move on, notice that the balanced reaction tells us that we have two moles of water vapor, so we'll need to multiply the entropy by two. Next, we subtract the reactants. Here again, notice that the hydrogen gas has a coefficient of 2, so we'll multiply the entropy of the hydrogen by 2. When we solve the equation, we get negative 88.5 joules per kelvin. Notice that the units of our answer are joules per kelvin this time, and not joules per kelvin mole. That's because we had to multiply some of our data by a coefficient, which has the unit of moles. The oxygen also had a coefficient, but that coefficient was 1, which we didn't write down. But that means that the moles cancel from all of our units. Once again, we got a negative number for the overall entropy. That means the amount of disorder is decreasing. And if you look at the balanced reaction, you'll see why. We started the reaction with two different compounds, but ended up with only one. Let's try one more example. This time, I'll choose a reaction that'll give us an unexpected result. 
We start with aqueous silver nitrate and sodium chloride as our reactants, and these produce products of solid silver chloride and aqueous sodium nitrate. Since we start with two aqueous solutions, but produce a solid, we might predict that the entropy decreases. And that's correct. When we plug in data from Appendix C, we find out that the entropy change is negative 34.32 joules per Kelvin mole. But wait, the second law of thermodynamics tells us that the entropy should always increase during a spontaneous reaction, but the entropy in this example decreased. Are we breaking the second law of thermodynamics? To understand why this reaction can still happen, we just need to remember the details of what the second law actually says. The second law states, a spontaneous process always results in an increase in the entropy of a closed system. The key here is those last four words. It turns out that the beaker where this reaction takes place is not a closed system. But why not? The system in this example is more than just the beaker and the chemicals in it. Instead, the system includes both the reaction and its environment. The environment includes the solvent in the beaker, the air in the lab, the glass of the beaker, and so on. The second law says that it's the entropy of the whole system that must increase. So, if the entropy of the reaction goes down, that means the entropy of the environment must go up even more. So, when this reaction occurs, the entropy of the environment must increase. What could make that happen? Well, as you might remember from our discussion of entropy in the last video, one way to increase the entropy is to raise the temperature. So, in order for this reaction to occur, it needs to heat up the environment. So how can we tell if the reaction actually does give off heat? Simple. We just use Appendix C to calculate the enthalpy of the reaction. Remember, this time we look up the enthalpy in the appendix, which is in the first column. When we do, we get this equation. That gives us an enthalpy of negative 65.9 kilojoules per mole. Notice that this is a negative number, so that means this is an exothermic reaction. So, the reaction does release heat, which is what makes it possible for the reaction to occur, even though the entropy decreases. Well, that's enough new material for now. In the next few videos, we'll explore the connections between the energy, enthalpy, and entropy of a chemical reaction in more depth, and we'll see that there's a lot more to learn about how all those properties are connected. I hope you'll join me for that. But until next time, have a good week!